Seeing here is a, a, a live example of some of the scrambling that takes place when you are making the best use of what you've already got. But that's the topic of the presentation today, and that's what I want to talk to all of you about. The uh, idea that you need some sort of specialized application or a really big expensive setup or, or even anything complex or confusing to do online learning is a policy. First thing, so let's get this presentation set up right. First of all, if you're just sitting back watching this presentation, kind of take it in, if you're doing it wrong. Uh, this should be something active. Even if you're not actually participating in the discussion, you should be following, writing things down, linking, talking to each other. Hopefully, if we get that room sound down, uh, I won't even uh, hear that so you can talk over this talk, that's fine. Secondly, it's more important during the presentation to attend to what I do during the talk rather than what I say. Uh, you know, this is, this is teaching everywhere, right? You, you can talk to your blip in the face and it doesn't register. And, and that's true for these talks as well. And it's really, really true for online talks. I know I was just listening to Jim Drew uh, do a live broadcast before uh, we came in here. Ask me what he said. I completely forgot. Sorry, Jim. Watch what we do. Watch, watch how this talk is set up. Uh, as Keith mentioned, we got three screens going here. Uh, screen one is the live Skype video conference. That's the Mac that's giving me uh, sound feedback right now. Uh, I like Skype. <coughs> Skype is great because it's free. It works really well. It work, generally works better than it's working right now. Generally you're not going to get the feedback. Uh, and, and it gives you a nice live video conference. I mean, look at this. This is what I'm getting live to all of you. Now I'm actually getting a good look at you for the first time because I didn't look before. I really, I'm too busy trying to set things up. Uh, and it's free. How can you beat that? It's free. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll add that. If you don't like Skype, sometimes Skype is blocked because it spoofs port 80 on your network. There are all kinds of other video conferencing solutions. I just simply Google web video conferencing. And then if you want to get rid of all the spam results at the top, just go past here. Uh, the uh, search engine optimizers are a lot, have a much more difficult time if you, you pick a date range or anything like that. All kinds of different video you know, conferencing options, video chat, Kui. Uh, I was playing with that earlier on, so it's uh, that was going to be hello, but I missed. And I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> Error. <laughs> so here we have our, our little. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I tested this earlier today, and it took me that long. Now what's going to happen here is once it gets all going here. It's going to ask for my flash, so I'll allow it my flash player settings. And well, there should be me there in the picture, uh, probably because I'm using the camera for something else. I can't actually access the camera. But if I wasn't actually broadcasting another video broadcast, I'd be seeing me right here in that corner. And it's that fast and it's that simple. Uh, another uh, web video conferencing I've tried is Uvu. Uh, now I got into a bit of a fight with them a little while back because uh, they sort of went commercial, but Uvu is a wonderful, wonderful, crystal clear video conferencing solution. Uh, really nice, easy things. So that's the first, first part of our conference is the live Skype video conference. You can do it pretty much anywhere, anytime. I've tested Skype in really horrible bandwidth situations and it adapts really well. And as I said, it's free. Second part is the screen share. We're using an application called JoinMe. Join.me. Here it is. This is even easier than Skype because all you do is you go to join.me, 
where it says share. You just click on the big arrow and it starts sharing your screen. What will happen is a little application will download. You have to uh, allow it to run. Uh, and then once it's running, you're sharing your screen. And, oops, am I still sharing my screen? I must yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, I'm just looking for the little widget that shows up at the top. There's a little widget, there it is. So I see this, here it is here, right? Uh, I see this on the top of my screen. There's a, a URL here. I copy it to my clipboard. And then I popped into the uh, live chat with Keith, pasted it in, and now he's able to share my screen as well as have a video conference with me. Now we set this up for the conference on two separate screens, but you know, it's really not that hard to have your, your screen sharing and your video conferencing going at the same time. That's what I'm doing right here. And I should get rid of that and build some more of my screen. This is just one option. Uh, uh, another one that I like a lot, and I use this all the time, is called Log Me In. This one is for people you trust, uh, because what it'll do is it'll actually share my uh, computer screen and give me remote control. Uh, Log Me In is again free, so if I want to access my computer at home, I hope I don't have any bad on it. <laughs> I forgot to check. Uh, so here I am, I'm logging in. And now I'm sharing my screen. Once it comes up, might be a couple of seconds here. It's connecting to my computer at home. I'm not home, obviously. Nobody's at home. I did leave it running. Uh, and it should still be running. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, and this is my home computer. And you can see the state of my computer when I got up and left this morning. And as you can see, I was reading uh, some stuff. So, uh, it's, and it's that simple. Uh, again, sharing and remote controlling. I could have gone in and started moving things around in my home computer, uh, but I don't have time for that. So, that's two out of the three things. The third thing is the back channel. Now, I've provided you guys with a back channel you can use. And here it is. The link to that back channel is uh, downs.ca slash thread slash 744. So uh, let's have a look and see if anyone's discovered it yet. So this, what this is, is a chat area, and it's being slow, so someone must have discovered it. Uh, a chat area where you can participate in the discussion in the room while I'm talking. So simply type your comment in the bottom form there, submit it, and in a few seconds it will come up. The way this back channel works is every 10 seconds it will show a new comment and so uh, put something up that people can read in 10 seconds. You, you can be kind of fancy if you want. Oh, that doesn't have a URL. Um, and I'm trying to find something quickly now with a URL. Quick, 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 quick. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you just can't find images, just plain images anymore. Here we go. So now we'll come back to the chat area and if you know, HTML, stuff like this will work. As he says, in theory, because they might have blocked that image or who knows, oh, there we go. So you put images up if you wish. Uh, this is for you to use, to comment to each other, put resources up, put links up, embed videos, whatever. All of this will be saved in the back channel archives and you can use this later on for your own reference. The idea here is that you can contribute while the uh, talk is going on. You get something like this where uh, it's sort of lost the thread, simply reload your window. Uh, so where's my reloader? Just reload and it'll all come back to normal again and you'll be well on your way to doing the back channel discussion. 
So the idea here is that we've got kind of an interaction going, right? Well, we sort of hope we have an interaction going here. Mostly it'll be an interaction, <laughs> all of you, from emails, get the get card, watch the back channel, and to watch the, uh, and to watch the, uh, Skype conference, etc. I can sort of organize things, but I am going to come back to my slideshow here and continue on. So here we are. Another way to do a back channel is just to use Twitter. If you don't have something like the Grasshopper back channel, now just as an aside, anyone can use that back channel anytime. Uh, if you if you go to the main back channel page. I allow people to set up their own back channels and use them themselves in conferences. But if you don't want to do that, you can go to the, you can use Twitter, and that's what this conference is doing. You've probably already been told about it. You can uh, open your Twitter account, and if you use this tag, mtech11 in your Twitter, oops, uh, mtech11 in your uh, Twitter account, then your comment will be seen by other people who are scanning for the tag mtech11. Now, when I was investigating this conference, because I like to know a little bit about what I'm talking about when I talk to people, uh, I found this. And I'm, I'm sure they've talked about this, but they must have, because otherwise you're going to point to it. This uh, conference app. So here's the conference app that was created for the MTech conference. And, and so here's the home page for that. Uh, here's the program. And actually, I found this really useful because I was able to uh, scroll down the program a ways and keep going here and find out about my own talk. But also, I can use this app and see what people are saying about the talk on Twitter. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to Stephen down to Canada. Please, God, make this work, says Keith <laughs> 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 um, Killing myself now. <laughs> so, uh, now I'm one of these people. I never leave well enough alone. So, Majubi, right? So M A J O O B I dot com. So I just followed that link. Your app is only minutes away. Try now. So I click try now, and I haven't actually done this. But label my own app. My app. Well, I can probably call it Stephen's app. Uh, okay, add an RSS feed. Okay, so let's. Two finger typing, folks. <laughs> and so there's my RSS page. And so, okay, that's good enough. Change name, set image, save up details, and continue. Free, duh. <laughs> okay, it's myself a name. Well, I haven't seen these screens before. I'm learning this as I go while I'm doing the presentation. Which might be a really stupid thing to do, but uh, okay, good enough. Yeah, save. See, so hope nobody's taking the uh, names. Like here, I didn't know what I'm running. Uh, request for file. Thank you, PHP. <laughs> good job, guys. Uh, okay, so my app is up and running. So let's go back now to here leave this page and so it should just be downs and voila I have made uh, I have made a application this is my app those aren't my mess to do so <laughs> oh here we go articles this is my article this is an article that I created for my newsletter earlier today uh, and now it's in my own personal app. This is the thing about what's online now. It's that simple. So now hopefully you're no longer impressed by the conference app because I made one without actually checking these down in that much time during the talk. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> Behind the scenes of this talk, 
there's a bunch of stuff happening. Now I've made nice slides for this conference, which you're watching on the slides here, or this, the slide screen. I will make these slides available after the talk, along with my other presentations. I use this, use this site called SlideShare, say that quickly three times, and I put all of my presentations up there. Uh, again, free site, free service. They give me a wonderful, nice flash interface. They allow me to download. I can declare a nice Creative Commons license on it. I can record an audio track. Uh, there are various other services for um, hosting online slides. I think Slide Rocket is another one. I didn't think to look them up before I started this. But anyhow, I upload all of my presentations on the slide share. One of the reasons why I do that, if anybody's in C chat yet. Oh, here we go, look at this. Uh, okay, what have people been saying? Sorry, I get distracted when I do these talks. Excellent. You got people talking? All right. Uh, so, I want to go home. So I'm going home. Oops, I probably should have stayed on this. Okay, so we'll ignore that's the, uh, now where is it? So, what I like to do is put my presentations on my own website. So here's one of my presentations from SlideShare embedded on my website. I can do this on any blog site uh, or other online site. So I can make my slides easily fall wherever I want. You can even import these, I believe, into some learning management systems. So, you know, the more locked down the learning management system is, the harder it is to do it this way. So that's one thing. Behind the scenes, I got my slides. I'll be uploading them on SlideShare. They're on slideshare.net slash downs, and you'll be able to access this slide, these slides, and all these links after. Now, another thing I had planned to do, but I can't actually do, was to broadcast this talk on live audio, live streaming audio radio. I've been using a service recently called DS106 Radio. It's set up by a guy called Jim Groom. And uh, what it is, is live streaming audio, basically. It's that simple. And I've been playing with this and having a wonderful time. One thing I forgot to do for today is to schedule the slot for this conference because I figure 11 o'clock uh, Atlantic time, nobody's going to be using DS Radio, but uh, Jim Groom is actually using DS Radio. So here's Showcast. Uh, this is uh, just an audio player. You can use Windows Media or iTunes or any other. And I'll just turn this on and see if he's still playing. Can you dig it? This is, you can probably you hear it, it now. Can you dig it? <laughs> first sign on to it. And let's see, Jim. It's key. This is Jim Broom giving a live talk somewhere else. I don't know where. Uh, he's using a program called NiceCast. That tells me that he's using his Apple computer, because NiceCast is an Apple application. And he's getting all excited. How to go, Jim? And so we're capturing Jim's broadcast uh, and turning it around and I'm live streaming his live broadcast from his live stream to all of you in Scotland. <laughs> right. uh, I was hoping to do that so that my broadcast here would be live streaming, but unfortunately, as I say, he's got the stream at the moment, so I'm just going to kill it. Uh, so what I'm doing instead is recording the audio. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, if you're wondering how all of that works, I wrote an article on my blog. Here it is called DS106 Radio. And I describe in exhaustive detail with piles of links how I made this work. You may have noticed that in this talk here, you're getting not just me, but you're getting sounds from my own computer, and so yeah, you kind of have to set up your computer to do that. It won't do that naturally out of the box. 
but I describe exactly how to make that work in this article so that if you're doing a live broadcast on Skype or whatever, and you're on your computer, you can bring in all the different sounds from your different applications into your presentation. So anyhow, uh, broadcasting of live audio, you use an application like IceCast or uh, IceCast or Showcast, and I recommend, because these things are a bit of a bear to set up, I recommend using a service like My Auto DJ. I can have unlimited bandwidth, huge amount of storage, 100 simultaneous listeners, $30 a month. Right. Um, now, as I said, we are recording the audio. And uh, let me just pop over here. That's, I should have probably said, I hope we're recording the audio. Yes, we are. This is a program called Audacity. And Audacity is recording this talk as I give it right now. Uh, and notice it's recording it in stereo, uh, although it's coming in in mono. But since I'm using some background sounds and effects, they may be in stereo, so I record it in stereo. Audacity is wonderful. Uh, and what I can do after I've done recording the audio is I'll save that as MP3. And you might think, okay, well, that's fine. You save some MP3 file. But here's what I do with my MP3 files. I put them up on my blog, and I make them able to play. So what do you do when it's Monday night? This easily. And there are zero listeners on DS106 radio. Well, what you do is if you're me, you prepare and assemble a live Arcade Fire concert out of YouTube videos. I've got the live queued up, loaded, ready to go. So let's kick it off. Arcade Fire in New York City. Now, the way I made that report is I played a bunch of YouTube you videos. On the arcade fire and they played the first minute of their song and they started and to that was the best moment of my life. I used Audacity to record these videos. And so this is Arcade Fire, they're a Canadian independent band. They just won a Grammy, so we're all very proud of them. Recorded it in Audacity, saved it, and okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, and what I did is I used a combination of three different programs to make this work. First of all, a program called Dropbox. Dropbox is just a place where I store stuff online. Then I used a service called Drop It To Me, which is a way I can allow anybody to drop stuff to my Dropbox. And then finally, I used a program called Boop, Boom and MP3, Boo MP3, whatever. And what you, what this does is it takes the content of your Dropbox that you've put in your public folder, and if you paste the link there, it'll give you a little MP3 player. So I built an MP3 player uh, out of three applications that are available for free online. So my MP3 storage and bandwidth is all being done for me for free. So. Uh, think about the process there. YouTube video to Audacity to MP3 saved, uploaded uh, to Dropbox, and now in my blog as a player on MP3. That's what I do with my audio. I'm also recording the video, and there's a bunch of ways to do this. Uh, Keith has a video camera going in uh, that room, right, Keith? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, now, because I don't trust Keith, I have one going here. And this is a, a flip cam. I love these things. These are the most wonderful things in the world. It costs like a hundred dollars. This is a really old flip cam, so it's only an hour worth of uh, video. But what I like about it is, in the newer ones, you know, you can get two hours, three hours, whatever. What I like about it is, you record your video and then. It, there's your USB, that's why they call it the flip cam, right? Uh, the US, little USB pops up, you put that in your computer, the files are AVIs, so that means the computer can use them right away, and you upload your file onto your computer. So I've got my video recording, Keith's got his video recording, he'll email me mine, and then what I'll do is I'll create a mixed video recording out of maybe the slides, uh, the flip cam recording, his recording, and I generally use a program called Adobe Premiere Elements to 
to uh, edit live video, but there are many other uh, many other video uh, editing tools available. If you want to be really fancy and got a few hundred dollars to spend, uh, you can't do better than Camtasia. Uh, Camtasia, I use it to uh, record uh, audio or slide casts and, and screen casts. It's a wonderful, easy way to make uh, video content. And then, of course, once you've created your video, upload it. I've got two areas online where I save my uploaded video. YouTube, this, if you're wondering, and I'll just skip to the end. Uh, YouTube's a little slow. This is me folding a piece of paper more than seven times. Eight times. It's kind of a tight fit. Nine? Yeah, probably not. I'd need thinner paper for that, like rice paper or something. But you can fold paper eight times. Don't believe it when they say you can only fold a piece of paper seven times. I love YouTube. Uh, and also, uh, in addition to YouTube, I use a service called Blip. I really like Blip, and the reason why I really like Blip is it allows me to put much longer uh, videos online. Uh, here's something I made with my uh, flip cam. Hi everybody, I'm Gary Thorne along with Bill Kupat for the Great Northwest we go. British Columbia is the site, Vancouver is the city. This is uh, Nintendo Wii. This is Wii Hockey. This is a game that I'm playing and I've recorded it. Uh, this is the cam. Here I am playing. And uh, there I am. I didn't really capture it quite well, but there I am with my take up hockey stick playing Wii Hockey. That's the sort of thing you can do with a flip cam and a flip TV account. You can probably think of more practical educational applications. <laughs> now, uh, I know I don't have a whole lot more time here. I think I've got something like 15 minutes, right, Chief? Yeah. Uh, what we've done, and I say we, I mean me, Jim Groom, George Siemens, Dave Cormier, and a bunch of other wide-eyed crazy people, is we've done all of this to present courses online. As the slide says, if you're still posting your course content into your LMS, you're doing it wrong. Online learning isn't about pushing content, it's about engaging, interacting, doing. And so we take the sort of approach that I've just described to you for this talk, and we use it for online courses. The type of course is called a MOOC, and that stands for Massive Open Online Course. And let me pop into one that we have going right now, and I'll show you what I mean. This is a course called Connectivism and Connected Knowledge. It's the uh, third iteration of the course that uh, has been offered by myself and George Siemens. Uh, this course web page is hosted in the application called Grasshopper, uh, which I created, but it could be any web page at all. It doesn't have to be something in Grasshopper. It's just a perfectly standard, ordinary web page. As you can see, we've embedded the, the ubiquitous welcome to a MOOC uh, video. This is Dave Cormier describing what a MOOC is. So if you come to this page after. ...response to the challenges faced by organizations and distributed... And I'm not going to play the video because it's four and a half minutes and we have 15 minutes left and I have about 30 minutes of material. So, uh, the original Collectivism and Connective Knowledge course was offered in 2008. Yeah. It grew about... Uh, 2,200 people to it. We did it in 2009 and got 700. This iteration has 800 people in it. And the, the method of the course is not, as I said, to present content to people which they will then memorize, but rather to immerse people into a network environment and get them working in this network environment, connecting themselves to people, connecting themselves to content. And the overall methodology that we recommend to people that they use can be summarized with four words or four phrases, aggregate, remix, repurpose, be forward. And this is kind of the way we structure the course. So 
aggregate. What do I mean? Aggregate means going out and getting content related to the course material. Now, we help people with this. For example, uh, we send them a regular newsletter. So here's the connectivism and connective knowledge newsletter. This is the one that came up this morning. Uh, it's, it tells people about the live session that's taking place uh, about an hour from now, actually. Uh, so I can't run over time because I have another thing right after this. Uh, posts and so on. Uh, as well, we have the archives for all of the new letters and as you can see, we've run, been running the course since mid-January. Uh, you don't have to use our special uh, system to send newsletters. Newsletters are really easy to create. The create your own newsletter mailing list with a service like PHP list uh, or uh, you can use something like Google Groups and Google Groups will send the uh, email newsletters out to uh, the people who join your group as well. So there are all kinds of ways to create regular newsletters that now begin to push this content out to people. Uh, now the content isn't learning content typically. What you're trying to do is to give people resources and links and other things that they can look at. I find that in my day-to-day -day activities, I have to remember my password in the presentation, thank you Google, uh, I find that Google Reader is probably one of the best and easiest things. I'm just cleaning up my uh, desktop here because well, I don't want a crashing in the middle of the talk. All right, back to Google Reader. This is my Google Reader. This is my window to the world, really. And as you can see, I subscribe to various blogs and newsletters and newspapers and magazines all over the place. Cyber culture, edgy bloggers. I've probably got pretty much the most comprehensive list of edgy bloggers there is. Uh, and other things. And I only use Google Reader to keep track of myself. Uh, if anybody talks about me on Twitter, I know about it because I subscribe to the RSS feed. Uh, for my courses, the CCK11 course, I'm aggregating content from Twitter using Google Reader because I just use, I did a Twitter search for the Connectivism course tag, which creates a feed that I can uh, uh, subscribe to, and now I can read all the uh, all the uh, Twitter comments that were made uh, about the course. How easy is that to do? Well, uh, oops, we need to do that. Back. Uh, that's so easy. We'll go into Twitter. And uh, what was the uh, need for this course? Do you remember, Keith? You must remember. It's, I'm sorry, say that again. Call that hash or ash. <laughs> okay. okay, so here's the search. Here's the RSS feed for the search. I'm going to subscribe to it. I'm subscribing to the search for this conference. I've clicked on subscribe. It's loading the RSS feed from Google, or sorry, from Twitter for this hashtag. Why should we call it hash? Right, okay. I would, I would call that pound soccer. Oh, yeah, right. Good job, guys. <laughs> so it's going to fail because why? Well, I'm in the middle of the presentation, that's why. So. <laughs> Let's do something else. We'll get the actual feed address. Oh, well, no wonder. That's the wrong feed for the search. Some things should actually rehearse before the talk. RSS feed for this query. Here we go. That's better. So, and you know, so it's empty. Good job, I'm guys. Uh, Emtech. Love it. This again is an example of the fiddling around that you sometimes have to do. And 
you know, with, with this sort of thing, that's just the way it is. You've got to fiddle around, try things, try other things, because uh, a lot of stuff breaks online, and that's just the way it is. Add a subscription, and there we go. Now I'm going to be able to subscribe. So here's the Twitter feed for EdTech 11, and now I'm reading the tweets that have been made about my talk as I make the talk. That's kind of cool too. And, but I'm not just reading them on Twitter, I'm reading them in my aggregator, my RSS reader. So that's the first thing. Now what we do with the uh, Connectivism course is we provide a type of file called an OPML. That doesn't look too impressive, but if we view the source, here's the source. And what this does is it gives us a list of feeds that somebody can subscribe to. And if you take this OPML, so here, the, the URL of the OPML file, and I'll just close this because I got a gazillion windows going here now, and that's not useful. So we'll come back to the Google Reader, and with my OPML file, and I'll go to Manage Subscriptions. Come on, go a little bit faster than that. Uh, import, export. So now I can choose a, a select an OPML file. Oh, right, there's, I forgot, there's no, uh, <laughs> you can't just post the URL in, you actually have to save it. So let's save this, save that to my desktop as opml.xml. And now we'll come back to Google Reader and we'll choose our file. Now that was in downloads. I have to remember where you say things. OPML.xml. There it is. Open. Upload. And now, in Google Reader, I am subscribed to all of the feeds that were provided to me from the course. And what, in fact, I've subscribed to, it's going to take a few minutes because there's an awful lot of feeds there. I didn't like that, okay. Um, and here they are, they're all at the bottom, I think. Oh, well, I don't know where they put them. Well, let's go back to the feeds and we'll see them all. Let's go back. All right, back to Google Reader we go. And all of these feeds now are all down here. So these are all these feeds starting here and going all the way down that I got from my OPML file. So what I've done is used an OPML file to add a subscription list of feeds from a variety of different people into my Google Reader, and now I can start reading posts from these feeds. Slowly, because it's Google Reader. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I kind of went through that a bit fast, but if you look up OPML on Google, if you mess around with Google Reader, you'll find all of this. But the next thing to do is once you've aggregated this content, okay, um, and there are different things that you can do to remix. You can use I use PaintShop Pro, uh, but there are uh, plenty of online uh, painting kinds of programs. Uh, Pictnet, P I C M or P I K N I K dot com is one. Or you can use docs.google.com. You can mix feeds and pipes. One thing that we provide to people in our course is a viewer, and this viewer allows them to go through the posts that people have written, and then we can pop into a comment screen and start and write our own comment about the post that we've been reading. Feed forward, sorry, repurpose, write your own blog, write your own WordPress blog, create your own content, delicious. All of these are online services that people are pretty familiar with. And then feeding forward, uh, we uh, ask people to provide us with their RSS feeds. Here are the feeds that are produced by the participants in the Connectivism course. And these are all student feeds, student content that we aggregate, we bring into the system or we feed on Google Reader. Here are the contributions that one person I've just chosen at random, seriously at random, I didn't need to look, uh, 
has contributed to the course. Ours isn't the only MOOC. You totally want to investigate some of these other MOOCs. The DS-106 uh, by Jim Groom is a MOOC about digital storytelling. They use photos, audio, video, the whole works, all kinds of do-it-yourself, create-it-yourself projects. DS-106 Radio was created for this DS-106 course. Critical Literacies is a course that Rita Kopp and I offered uh, not too long ago. Uh, this course was important to me anyways because it explained the background literacies that I believe are required in order to succeed and flourish in this kind of distributed, multi-content, multi-format kind of environment. Uh, Plank Personal Learning Environments, Networks and Knowledge is a course that four of us taught uh, last fall. Learning Analytics is a course that does not use Grasshopper that was offered by George Siemens. Plank 12 is one that was created by Wendy Drexler, Chris Sessons. Uh, EC and I 381 uh, is a course offered by Alec Poros uh, in Saskatchewan. And just today, Alan Levine announced uh, a network seminar that he says is not your grandma's MOOC. How do you keep up with all this? I've thrown a whole pile of stuff at you. Create your own personal learning network. Connect with other people. Create some online, online presence. And then use these tools and all of these capacities to stay connected, to put your content up, to aggregate, to read other people's content, and stay creative, stay making things, because it's through the making things and the sharing of things that you really keep up. That's my talk. Uh, sorry about the, the rush near the end, but it wasn't that rushed to end. All of those links are available, as I said, my slides will be online. And I thank you for your time and your exit. I hope you enjoyed the back channel. I'll be looking at the uh, archives. Keith, over to you. Bye.